Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, event here at Brookings. Um, I'm Lenny Bernstein. I'm a health and medicine reporter at the Washington Post. Uh, I've been covering the opioid epidemic now for about uh, the last three years pretty intensively. Um, as David mentioned, uh, tonight is the second in a series of film events that Brookings will host over the next year. Um, tonight, obviously, the focus was the uh, opioid epidemic. Uh, both the, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, both the domestic situation and the situation abroad. Um, I just want to bring up a few uh, a few points of information that I like to uh, make sure everybody knows. Probably a lot of you have heard this all before, but in, for those who are are uh, maybe new to this, um, we are now 22 years into this epidemic. OxyContin was introduced in 1996, kicked off the pill epidemic, which led to the heroin epidemic, which led to the fentanyl epidemic. Uh, it's not like any of the first two have gone away. Um, we, are, we are still in the grip of all three forms of opioid abuse. Um, in 2016, the last year that we have numbers for, uh, about uh, 64,000 people died of all forms of uh, drug overdose, and about two-thirds of those were opioids. Um, for context, that's about 175 people every day, or if twice the population of this room just suddenly disappeared every 24 hours. That's, that's what the folks in that movie are looking at. Um, we, uh, we, Congress has finally begun to address this. Uh, there are 57 bills headed to the House floor right now to address various aspects of the opioid epidemic. Everything from uh, treatment to um, prevention to enforcement, um, and uh, we it remains to be seen exactly what is going to happen and how we're going to find our way out. Um, today, we're privileged to have three experts on this subject. Um, you have their bios, so I'm not going to I'm going to dispense with that. I thought I might be able to ask you guys just to start. Um, with an assessment of the epidemic, short, brief. Where have we been? Where are we going? Vanda? Well, I'll let uh, Keith speak perhaps about the domestic um, size of the epidemic. Let me just make a few comments. Um, it is really one of the worst public health crises uh, in the United States. It's certainly um, the, the worst drug epidemic uh, in the United States. And it's very important to keep in mind how the drug epidemic started including with the uh, bad management of legal uh, prescription opioids and the um, uh, many failures uh, that uh, went into properly regulating uh, that, uh, that issue. The numbers are staggering, and we are seeing them in the United States. We are also seeing uh, really bad numbers in Canada, including in some of the places in Canada, such as Vancouver, where um, approaches such as harm reduction strategies are widely used. Um, Keith and I and our colleague John Calkins uh, recently had an article in Foreign Affairs that highlights the risk that the opioid epidemic will spread abroad. There are many dimensions to it. We are already seeing uh, the spread of synthetics abroad, um, as well as other drugs that, for example, in West Africa, uh, addiction related to tramadol uh, is becoming very, uh, very strong. Uh, and, and many more dimensions to it can come, part, part as a result of uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, trying to pursue the same problematic um, unethical policies abroad, but also because of the emergence of um, synthetic illegal narcotics and illegal opioids. And um, the, the, the crisis in the United States, um, it's also reshaping um, global drug markets, global illegal drug markets, and uh, has the potential to radically change relations um, and power dynamics between criminal groups. We are already seeing some of that in Mexico, and perhaps we can talk about that uh, in the conversation. So uh, for, for, I don't know, starting around 2005 or so, I was saying to audiences, this could become as bad as AIDS. And now what I say is it's, it's in fact, worse than AIDS. 
So with 42,000 registered opioid overdose deaths in, uh, in the most recent data, but because a lot of coroners don't record uh, the specific drug, it's actually about 50,000 for that year, which is worse than the worst year of, uh, of AIDS. And overdose deaths are really only the tip of the suffering that's going on. For every person who dies of an overdose, there are 30 uh, non-fatal overdoses. I mean, the body, the brain are deprived of oxygen. Many people uh, experience lifelong damage from that, even though they live. And then there are millions of people who are addicted to prescription opioids, to heroin, who are, even if they're functioning and they don't overdose, the life is very difficult uh, 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 psychologically, the ability to hold a job, the ability to function in family roles. There's a great deal of suffering involved. So it's really a tragedy, worst, worst public health epidemic of my lifetime. Pagan? Um, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Uh, although I did um, live in that world for about two years. What I would say is um, when, when we started to make this show, it was very important to us to take, to go past the statistics and take a, a look at personal stories, at intimate stories. And for me, it was very important to look at the families because I feel like it's so devastating on a family and a community level. Because um, when you have an overdose, you know, it doesn't just affect the one person. It affects everybody around them. Um, and also in Mexico, you know, it's like the growing the drug there, that's that whole community. So um, just to broaden out from the opioid epidemic, I, we also very much felt like this is symptomatic of the failures of the drug war, you know, and that money is put here or here or here and nobody seems to look at the big picture. And so what we saw with our characters in particular is people trying to make rational choices in an irrational world. And as you can see in the last scene for the parents, it's like they don't know how to cope with this. So we, we just saw so much helplessness in all forms, you know, in law enforcement, the people in Mexico who were doing what they needed to for their families and with the families, we saw a lot of helplessness and not a lot of answers. Although I will say in our series, um, in the last episode, we did see how law enforcement is changing a lot, you know, taking more of a social worker approach, um, doing sort of trying to take people to treatment. So we did, in the course of our filming, see some changes, but mostly we saw a lot of helplessness. There's so much to, to discuss about the show, but to me, it, the, the, probably the most shocking thing was the matter-of-fact way that the drug cartel leader described what he does there. I mean, this is our business. They could have been mixing cement in there without the you know, AK-47s. This is all we have. This is all we do. We have to do this to, to make a living. Um, no thought about what's going on up here, right? I mean, they know that their drugs are going, and they know that there's an epidemic in America and that people are dying, but there's a certain amount of compartmentalization, I would say, because they feel like, well, it's people's choice if they take the drugs and if they die. And there's very little investment in Guerrero. Um, you know, it's one of the poorest provinces. It's one of the most dangerous states. It was actually the most dangerous state in Mexico. So, um, I mean, the, gro the growers in particular, they're like, listen, we would grow avocados if we made more money. You know, th this is a choice they've made for their families. Um, with him, it's a little more complicated. You know, obviously, there's, there's some other dynamics there. But, um, you know, there's an awareness of what's happening in, um, what is happening in America. But as I was saying um, before um, to, to Keith, to Keith um, in Mexico, the addiction is not prevalent. So it's very fascinating. You know, we filmed over and over again them making it. You know, and I was always worried about my crew because it's like, you know, they're standing there with a mask. And I mean, this stuff is like cancer causing, in all honesty. They're just standing there watching it. But they, they don't drink, most of the people in the town. They don't take drugs. The, the Don Miguel doesn't take any drugs. Um, um, but you were mentioning that usually at some point it does. But I mean, in Mexico, really, the drugs are shipped here. They're not you know, I, I would their... point out that that's changing. It's not the case so much yet with opiates, but it certainly became very much the issue with cocaine. And some of the key battlegrounds like Ciudad Juarez or Tijuana have become um, highly contested also because of what's called narconuemos, what, what are local distributions for drugs. Part of that is that um, traffickers inevitably they tend to pay uh, 
uh, in kind. They tend to pay in drugs for two reasons. It's far cheaper than paying in cash and it involves the problems of having to uh, change uh, drugs into cash and dealing with liquidity, uh, but it also creates uh, customers. So over time, uh, addiction tends to rise. And in fact, one of the key issues for Mexico uh, and Mexican government, Mexican society, is to start thinking about what kind of addiction uh, will come, is coming already. Uh, it's mostly linked to other issues than, than or opium poppy and, and uh, heroin, but that too is changing. The big uh, switch that has taken place, of course, is the rise of fentanyl and its potency. So we are already seeing a suppression of poppy prices in uh, the production area, such as in Guerrero and elsewhere. What that means is that because they are being displaced by fentanyl. So over time, the production of, uh, of heroin there will start flooding to other markets, whether in Mexico or elsewhere. As we saw in the movie, at least at the street level, users are dealers and dealers are users, right? I mean, this is done to support a habit here in the United States. Um, is that something you expect will happen in Mexico as well? You know, it's indeed, it's a very common phenomenon that people who become addicted usually um, uh, cannot hold regular jobs unless they come uh, from highly privileged families and have access to money. So the way to support the habit, which becomes devastating and, and uh, has a grip on the person, is to deal in drugs. Very, very common phenomenon across the world. Yeah, it's. All, I think drug dealers are have very good uh, Hollywood agents because in, in the movies they're very competent and impressive and intimidating. But in real life, they're more like what you saw in the the film, which is people you feel sorry for, even though they're doing something destructive. And there's another slice of the dealing population that is not addicted, but is just making ends meet. So uh, you know, in regions of the country where middle class jobs have been hollowed out, uh, there are people who do a little dealing on the side. It might be a mom who works at Walmart and doesn't use drugs but just needs a little extra money, or grandma who can't quite make the food bill, so she sells a little bit of the oxycontin she's prescribed for pain. And that's a lot of the the picture. And that's why arresting huge numbers of dealers never amounts to anything. It's such a you know they're very easily replaced. They're low skilled jobs, and there's just a, you know millions of people doing that. Oh, but one thing I was going to say that we heard about um, from law enforcement that we saw is that with this epidemic, it really moved into the suburbs. So what you're talking about is like um, Chief Minard, who we shot with in Columbus, the deals happen in Walmart. The deals happen, you know, whereas before in the, epi- the heroin epidemic in the 70s and 80s, it was inner city. It's like it, it's moved into the suburbs. It's moved into the small towns. It's moved into obviously we did focus on the white population, you know. Um, and even though the numbers now are changing, I know, you know, with African-American population here in America, but it really had changed. And uh, what he was saying, and what we heard in Mexico, too, is that they were like, hey, the money's in the suburbs. And there was a calculated move to move into the suburbs, to move where the money is, to move where the middle class is. And then the pain killer, I mean, the opioid overprescribing supported that. So like the cartels, in a way, the cartels and the overprescribing and the prescriptions happen together, you know, and have created this. It's been this kind of a thing. That's a very fundamental issue that was raised and also by Keith. The big difference between the opioid epidemic and its um, beginning in the uh, overprescription of, of opioids and the legal change through which they were derived is that for the first time we are really seeing a drug epidemic that is linked to the uh, the um, addicted people are not just dealers in the way that they are in cocaine or heroin. They are actually the source of supply. And it showed up in the movie. How is that? Uh, because they can get um, vast amounts and appropriate amounts of uh, opioid pills and then sell them for heroin. So uh, this is really what's al- what altered the dynamic so fundamentally. The access to supply was so much larger than anything that we have seen in illegal markets. And one of the big takeaways is that legal company, legal markets have the capacity, such as in tobacco, uh, to deliver uh, addiction uh, at a far greater rate uh, than the illegal market ever can. Yeah, it's been interesting watching drug policy for a long time to hear some very prominent people who endorse drug legalization, revisit that in light of the opioid epidemic. So let's talk about that for a little while. We are, it's taken us a few years to understand we're not going to arrest our way out of this epidemic, but are we going to treat our way out of this epidemic? Are we going to, you were saying earlier, uh, if the health um, 
mechanism in America got a hold of this, maybe that would work, but you, you don't necessarily feel so. No, and I'm a health guy. I mean, that's what I do. Uh, I, I see health... The role we're in is very similar to an adolescent looking at their parents. And adolescents can tell you how stupid their parents are. When they're <laughs> parents, they're not going to make any mistakes. You just wait. And then they become parents, and they realize, boy, being a parent is actually very hard, and you do the best you can, and you make mistakes, and so on. So in drug policy around the world, the cops have been the parent. They've been in the lead, and health has been often minimized and pushed to the side. And there's a, a fantasy among many of us that if we were running things, this would go away. And, uh, you know, it won't. I mean, most obviously because it was doctors who started all this to begin with. But second, even we, we profile Vancouver and, uh, you know, in the um, article of uh, Vonda and, and John and I, you know, and they have tremendous, you know, they have all, every health services, you know, they have injection rooms, they have heroin substitution, they have needle exchange, they have treatment, they have universal health care, and their overdose rate is about the same as West Virginia, which is, has none of those things. So it, 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 there has to be supply control. Which, which is done usually through the law in addition to health. And it may take, you know, poli police, I find, have learned that they can't do this by themselves. I mean, when I worked in the, the White House and the police came in, they sounded like social workers. They said, what we want is more treatment, more treatment, more treatment. They've, they've figured out they can't do it. I don't know that health has done that yet, and it may have to take that experience of being handed this problem and realizing, God, it's really hard, and we're going to have to all work together on this. So what does supply control look like? Well, in the health care system, I mean, we have enormous leverage over people, in part because these are all incredibly highly trained uh, people who need their license to work. And there's a whole range of things. I mean, doctors I divide into three groups. I mean, there's the biggest group, thank God, are good doctors who do the right thing. And what they need is to be left alone. Then you have another group, uh, not as big as the first, are good doctors and they do the wrong thing. And they need education and better clinical practice guidelines and sometimes nudges from the organizations they work in. These would be all the primary care doctors who got a lot of misinformation from, you know, pharma detailers and then started thinking that you could just prescribe and there'd be no risks. And by the way, an American doctor, average medical school training in pain is seven hours. Okay. A veterinarian gets 50. So, so huge deficit in training, how to manage pain, all the ways to manage pain without opioids. And then there's this very small group at the end, thank God a very small group, but are not good doctors. And that's why you have police officers. I mean, there are still people who do absolutely outrageous things who are just essentially drug dealers who have a stethoscope and they need, and they're, they're, they can be profoundly destructive. One doctor can put millions and millions of doses on the street. Yeah, well, this, uh, when I was in the, the Obama uh, drug office, we used to get a list of who were the top 100 OxyContin prescribers, individuals. 98 of the top 100 were in South Florida. The year I was there. Oh, yeah. And it's not that painful to live in South Florida. It's actually a pretty nice <laughs> part of the country. Uh, and they were, and they initiated a, an epidemic throughout the entire southeast. People were, you know, where I'm from, West Virginia, they were, you know, going there to get their pills, bringing them back in garbage bags and selling them, and it's just an absolute... Take uh, the nightmare. Oxy Express down the... That's what they called it, yeah. You know, we also, however, need to think in the regulation about the pharmaceutical companies, and that's a big issue f for the United States, and it's a big issue heading abroad. Um, where um, in very large parts of the world, pain is severely and in inappropriately medicated. In many developing countries, people do not have any access to uh, painkillers, even for excruciating illnesses such as um, terminal cancer. And uh, clearly, uh, addressing their pain needs, palliative care, is a humanitarian priority that cannot be neglected, cannot be dismissed. At the same time, we want to avoid the catastrophic epidemic that the United States has witnessed and that has the potential to, uh, to move abroad. So how do we do that? In the article, we think about various ways to regulate pharmaceutical companies, such as, for example, limiting advertising. That's difficult in the United States. Although some of the companies have volunteered, they will no longer be sending their sale representative to doctor's offices. Um, under some circumstances, we could imagine and we explore in the article, for example, ways to fine pharmaceutical companies, not just a one-time fine, but fine for every overdose that could be linked to uh, the person being um, initially prescribed uh, painkillers. Um, we could um, also think about... Um, having uh, preventing the regulatory capture that really took place in the United States where uh, agencies responsible for investigating fraud like Drug Enforcement Administration became prohibited by Congress to investigate pharmaceutical companies. That law is still on the books and it needs to be repealed. 
Uh, and um, you know, moving abroad, we could imagine um, other uh, scenarios, such as um, uh, painkillers being delivered by government agencies to the extent they are present or by um, the World Health Organization, uh, but not going through uh, private hands or not being sent to patients uh, uh, at home. So you could require, for example, that, that a, some sort of clinical um, uh, worker uh, is sent to administer uh, the medication in regulated doses. But, I mean, we've had the Controlled Substances Act here in this country for 45 years. There's a lot of money in this. The pharmaceutical companies have found ways around it or ways of, of uh, turning their head when, you know, millions of pills go into a small town in West Virginia. Um, do we need to arrest the executives of a pharmaceutical company? I've had a lot of people say to me, if we were able to take two or three of these guys out in handcuffs, it would send a message to the entire group. A point we make in the book... Or in the book, excuse me. Um, I've made our article into a book. <laughs> You're going to have a heart attack. Um, Coming. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in the article is Purdue Pharma you know, was convicted in federal court, uh, and their three executives were held criminally liable. That company's revenue to this point on OxyContin is $35 billion. They spent not one night in jail. If you sell one ten millionth as much heroin as $35 billion, you have a mandatory minimum of five years. That, to me, is just shocking and outrageous on both, on both uh, ends of that. So, yes. Absolutely. Why not? I mean, p- particularly when they knew what they were doing. Well, and but, you know. well, What do you think about the lawsuits that are starting now with the attorney generals in different states that are suing the pharmaceuticals? What, what I am most struck by about those lawsuits is this. So when I go back home to West Virginia and they read your reporting, Lenny, your terrific reporting on how the Congress basically you know, covered up for these companies, is that they're an expression of the sense in the country that Washington has utterly failed us. No one's protecting us. Congress is bought off. This is how they would describe it and use those words. And this is the last recourse we have as, a, as an individual, as a county, a community, a state. And that's what I see. What will happen legally, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But that's what I think is going on for, for people. Do you country. think the, are you saying the pain of that giant um, lawsuit, the, uh, the suits that have all been um, consolidated in Ohio, mm-hmm. is the way to go? To cause, cause pain? <laughs> That much well, financial pain to, I, the, to yeah, the ideally, Yeah, ideally, it's not just financial pain. It's also a new regulatory environment, which, as I understand from the judge, is the goal. Right. So if, if it's just a check, the check will be written. And, you know, the Purdue, the Purdue fine was something like $600 million. But if you make $35 billion in revenue, eh, cost of doing business. So something more enduring that says, you know, you cannot, we will not, you know, tax subsidize advertising anymore. We won't, just let me finish, please, Mark. But also then that there are ongoing penalties if the problem continues. But I just want to say, it, to me, it's part and parcel somewhat of what's going on with this administration, but also the way this country approaches these things where we let corporations do whatever they want. They never seem to go to prison, and we demonize completely um, people in Mexico and in other places who are trying to survive, and admittedly some of them are committing crimes, but it's like billions of dollars, 60,000 people have been dying a year, many of them as a result of what these companies are doing, and none of them have been held accountable. And yet, you know, you have a president going on raging about the people coming from other countries, you know, and so to me there's, there's other dynamics going on there as well where it's like they're just not holding a certain group accountable. And, you know, and, and, and admittedly in our film, we don't highlight as much. We, it was not within our capacity to do investigative reporting of your like on. But, um, you know, so it looks like, oh, Mexico is sending drugs to America and Americans are dying when really there's this whole, as you said, 22-year phenomena that's been going on. But I, I also just want to say I was very moved and frustrated by just the lack of a national approach to treatment. You know, family after family after family, when we filmed with the drugs are, which didn't end up in our show, would say, what is going on with these treatment centers? They would, you know, put a second on their house. They would put thousands of dollars. You know, if you're a parent, you will do anything to save your child. I mean, that, to me, what's so heartbreaking is parents are natural codependents. You know, the, the kid comes, I need money, you know, and the parents just keep giving it. They don't want to give up on their child, but then they end up feeding the addiction. And so, you know, they would put all this money into these treatment centers, and some of them would be 
Al-Anon-based. You know, some of them would be medically-assisted treatment-based, but there was no national database as a parent where you could say, where do I go? What will actually work? And some of these kids had been, you know, into rehab five, six, seven, eight times. And then you also have the fact that all these insurance companies, many of them were paying thousands of dollars, so much money. I mean, you probably know. Billions of dollars are spent on treatment, and nobody can really give us proper data on what's working. And I think most doctors agree medically-assisted treatment is what's necessary with heroin and opioid. But I, just to see the lack of, to see so many people dying, to see such an incredible epidemic, an epidemic this generation of this that we've never seen before, and a lack of a cohesive, coherent approach from the medical community was shocking to me. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, right now the mantra is expand treatment, particularly medically assisted treatment. And I've written it myself a million times. That's what works best. It works better than 12-step. It works better than anything else. But in your film, we saw what treatment looked like, right? It was mom handing out little films of buprenorphine and a couple of pills. And what happened? Skylar went off and got high again. So in addition to us not having enough, do we have the right forms of treatment? Yeah, I, that, that was a very powerful moment for me, is because I, I get calls from Skylar's the, the, the Skylar's mom every week, yeah. and um, not literally, but you know pe- people like that, and and it's always I always my heart sinks because the person who needs to call isn't calling, and so the moment when she said my number one priority is your sobriety or uh, recovery, and he says my number one priority is my freedom. freedom. That was the telling moment. And that, I am all for treatment. I've spent a whole bunch of my career on it. We should definitely expand treatment, make more accessible, but we have to also deal realistically with what it's like to be addicted, is that many people just do not want to get into treatment. His, his goal is to use more heroin at the moment. And so it's not, when I hear these things sometimes said very simply, so-and-so broke into someone's house, stole something for drugs, let's give them treatment and not jail, that implies they go to treatment, and they often will not, and that's very difficult. That said, we are still failing the people who are willing to go to treatment because the treatment system is so uneven in quality. There are terrific programs and there are terrible programs, and it's what happens when what you know, is meant to be a health care service grows up outside the health care system. Addiction treatment's not like pediatrics or cardiology or oncology that was birthed within. It was basically birthed within the criminal justice system, social welfare, you know, like Salvation Army, and uh, peer self-help groups. And, you know, all of them helped some people, but none of them are health care. None of them are subject to the constraints we are, the regulations, the requirements, the, you know, the patient protections, that sort of thing. And so you have this wild west uh, of, you know, of incredible variability in quality and, and also some programs that are just frankly abusive and they treat people that you could never do that. If you did that at the hospital, you'd be shut down in a second. And so, the, oh, I to add one more comment. Uh, you know, devastating as the, as the film was and what uh, Keith is describing, in the opiate space, the knowledge as to what works in treatment, including substitutions, including uh, drugs such as um, buprenorphine, is really not available for many other forms of addiction. So take, for example, meth addiction, uh, really the, um, the, the epidemic in East Asia so far, uh, where we don't know what works in treatment. So, you know, whatever abusive conditions are here, treatment in East Asia, in places like the Philippines where uh, President Duterte has declared a war on drugs, which is essentially state-sanctioned murder, uh, the treatment essentially involves putting people into um, detention facilities where they go uh, called Turkey with whatever effects on their health. But we don't have good treatment for something like meth addiction. Mm. So are we condemned to pass out naloxone and open supervised injection sites and do needle exchanges without a lot of progress? We have to keep track of two things at the same time. People who are currently addicted and all the people who might be addicted in the future. So the most important thing, while we are at this point prescribing per capita eight times what Europe prescribes, is we need to turn that tap down and get back to where we were before. We still need opioids. They are terrific medications. And by the way, I worked in hospice for almost a decade. I'm a big believer in adequate pain management. And prescriptions are down a tiny bit. They're down a tiny bit, but we we have to drop about 80% to get where, you know, what the world typically does. And countries like France and Italy, which have comparable levels of pain to us, 
prescribe a bare fraction of the opioids. So that, on the prevention side, we need to do that. That, uh, that uh, keeps us from creating the creating next new, generation. Yes. Of yes, that's right. And then, you t- and then you treat or keep alive, if you can't treat, those people who are currently addicted. And, and sometimes that will involve very sad, horrible things to watch. And I've had to, uh, you know, been ex- close to some of these families where someone gets naloxone and overdoses and the next day it happens again and again and they go into treatment and they come out. It's, it's very terrifying. But what else can you do? I right. mean, you know, if you, if, if you have a good society, and I would point out, by the way, if somebody has a heart attack and they've already been hit by the paddles, you know, a week before, we still try to save them again. So all we're really doing is treating people with drug problems the same way we treat anyone else who has a health problem. Right. Fonda, um, we haven't said much about fentanyl. What are the challenges that we face keeping fentanyl out of this country, out of the heroin supply? I'm not sure how much people know about how easy it is to smuggle heroin, I'm sorry, fentanyl into this country and why that is and how it gets mixed into the drug supply. Could you talk about that? Sure. And um, I would start, Lenny, by suggesting that the first challenge is really keeping fentanyl and other analogs, synthetic analogs, out of use. And that's because uh, these drugs are so much more potent, 100 times heroin and and other analogs like carfentanil, multiple times of that. So what that means is that very tiny amount uh, can very easily lead to overdose. And even uh, users who are experienced users find it often very hard to correctly mix or correctly cut uh, the dose to avoid uh, overdose, particularly if they do not actually know the percentage of fentanyl um, with respect to either heroin in, in which it is mixed or increasingly fentanyl is mixed into cocaine. That's also uh, driving the um, uh, death rate and overdose regarding cocaine in the United States. So it's a crapshoot every time you go out and buy some. You don't have any idea what the proportions are. Well, and so, you know, one, uh, one possibility that has been... Um, tested in Europe and places like the Netherlands and ex- expanding in the United States is having free accessible non-threatening um, uh, drug testing labs where users could go and have their product tested. Now, this sounds good and it had successes uh, in prior versions with synthetic, with other synthetic drugs such as meth and various um, uh, ecstasy and various other uh, other synthetic drugs in the Netherlands. What is so distressing about the, the current experimentation with that is that users um, are actually disappointed when they don't find fentanyl in whatever they bought because they are not. Uh, they believe they are not getting enough value for their money. So uh, you know, very distressingly, the users are actually self-selecting now toward fent- fentanyl uh, being part of the compound. So. Go, to go to your question then, why is it such a problem to keep it out of the country? Because of the ratio of potency to weight, which makes it so different than um, certainly drugs like marijuana, which made the big difference between marijuana and cocaine. And now we have again a, uh, an order of magnitude change with potency to weight ratio for synthetic drugs such as fentanyl, carfentanyl, other analogs. So what it means is that it's very easy to um, uh, ship uh, sufficient supply, to sufficiently supply the market by using traditional uh, traditional mail services, traditional delivery services. You can essentially dispense with the problem that suppliers of drugs like heroin or cocaine have from abroad. They need to, they cannot simply ship enough packages of cocaine through the post. Sometimes they do, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult big. to do it's, that, It's right? bulky. It's bulky, it's detectable. Um, uh, but as uh, the, the potency to, uh, to weight ratio makes it much more feasible for synthetic drugs. I was just going to say, anecdotally, what we saw, because um, uh, fentanyl appears more and more in the series. In the second episode, there's an overdose death, and um, they're researching it. And you hear that fentanyl, as we were filming, the, the police would say, we wish we were getting heroin. You know, they keep finding fentanyl everywhere. But... Um, while we were filming, they were starting to target FedEx. This is Senator Portman in Ohio was working on it. They were starting to target FedEx and UPS sites. So as packages would come in, because what people do is they go on the dark web, look up the chemicals, buy it from China, it shows up, and they mix it, you know, and they mix it haphazardly. And so, you know, you might get a clean one and you get one with fentanyl. But anyway, so they were 
um, starting to in UPS and FedEx scan boxes from China, and then the uh, Homeland Security would follow the box as it was going to be delivered, and then they would bust the person in the trailer. So they're coming up with ways to interfere with it, but now places like Mexico are also buying fentanyl and mixing it into their heroin. And what we would hear from the addicts is they would be like, I want the good stuff. So they so, would want this stuff with fentanyl in it because so they want see, the high that's almost as close to death as possible. That's what I was going to say. You would see people running toward the thing that would kill, that is most likely to kill them. Mm-hmm. I mean, what they usually do is they shoot up, they try to not shoot up alone, and they shoot up with, um, you know, the you know the stuff that they, they all the carry. Lock- yeah, yeah, they all carry naloxone, but, you know, they, and the dealers would say, you know, so like the idea that, I mean, because fentanyl, if morphine's a one, heroin to two, fentanyl's a 50, right? So it's very, very potent. And so it's, it's, you know, there's, I, for what we heard when we filmed with each other, they're coming with ways, different law enforcement is coming with different ways to battle it, but you have a high demand for it. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. It's hard to battle. So Vonda, if I went on the internet right now, how long would it take me to order fentanyl and get it here in a, an envelope or something that would be not suspected by the authorities? Well, depending on your skills, uh, there, will be variation in, uh, there will be variation in time. You know, clearly, um, in the United States, there is now focus on fentanyl, and most users and most uh, dealers for that matter will just not go for fentanyl. Um, you will see various code names for it. What is happening with um, the dark web and for that matter with very many con- commodities, not simply fentanyl, is of course that lots of that is mo- moving onto private social platforms that are, not, that are just much more difficult to, to monitor. To monitor. Um, but, um, you know, the f- there are very many potential sources of supply, right? So a lot of uh, synthetic opioids are coming from China, uh, Many are coming from India, and potentially you can imagine very different um, uh, sources of supply. Nigeria, South Africa, Indonesia, you know, very, very many sources um, in a way that's fundamentally different than in plant-based drugs where you require substantial territory that is visible where the state authorities um, have limited access to. So that's truly terrifying. If I don't need land to create illegal drugs, what I need is a lab in a basement. So that changes the whole landscape, right, Keith? Absolutely. I mean, and that, that's, we give a lot of attention to that in the, uh, in the paper. Um, it changes things for enforcement. It is, it, I, I think, actually, crop eradication has mostly been pretty hopeless anyway. But uh, nonetheless, if you were minded to do that, what difference would it make if it's not coming from plants? That has a good effect, then. You no longer alienate uh, domestic populations who see that as their livelihood or in a place like Afghanistan, don't drive them into the hands of the Taliban, either because they need the money or they just are so angry that you've you know, starved their family. Um, it makes it very uh, difficult to suppress for very long because um, people can just bounce a lab from here to there. You don't need the kind of labor anymore. It's extremely hard to monitor compliance. So with the, these other countries, you, we can... You could, we can you, you know, aerially, you can tell about, you know, grows, right, over mountainsides. It's a lot harder to say, are you sure that there's no fentanyl lab in China somewhere? It's a very easy thing to hide. So it, cha- it changes that equation as well. And it is kind of frightening. I mean, it could be where drugs end up, where drug policy ends up, is we really, in the age of an Internet and cryptocurrencies and all that, we can't stop any more people getting drugs. So the game will be almost entirely about persuading people not to use them. Like the folks who produce them in Guerrero and never, never touch their own, never touch their own supply. Well, you know, so never touch their own supply is also a question, right? I mean, you were pointing out to me that you are not wearing gloves. I mean, one issue in Afghanistan, uh, where um, you know, very uh, substantial portion of the uh, country's GDP is linked to the opium poppy economy, is that you see the same scraping method. Uh, but it's often conducted because it's so labor-intensive. It provides employment to very vast segments of population, millions of people. And it also employs women. It's often the only area that is accessible to women to, to earn money mm-hmm. for their households. And it also often involves small children who are scraping the resin. And they do it with, uh, with just wooden scrapers that, of course, leave the sticky resin on their fingers, uh, which they uh, frequently lick because it's sticky, 
And so you end up with, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, with very vast uh, addiction rates where often the, the potency, the, the, the levels of the, the, which children are exposed to is what would kill a heroin addict in the United States because they have for so many years been accustomed to being around not even heroin but just the opium poppy resin. That's incredible. Um, what does persuasion look like? Well, before we get there, one last question about China. China cracks down on a lot of things it doesn't like. Why can't it stop fentanyl? Or does it not want to? Well, uh, the Obama administration engaged very extensively with China and got China to schedule um, fentanyl and four other analogs um, as um, prohibited substances, as a scheduled substance. The problem with synthetics is how they get scheduled. Uh, often um, in the United States, the scheduling is for a particular uh, formula. Uh, that, however, for particular chemical formula. That, however, means that if you are um, a chemist, you can slightly alter the formula and the drug will no longer be illegal. Gotcha. So you have uh, many, many uh, analogs of uh, drugs. So China keeps scheduling because of its own interest or under U.S. pressures, but new analogs are being made. Britain has tried to resolve that problem, um, and uh, there are other um, countries that are experimenting with this by saying that any drug that uh, acts on particular brain receptors would be automatically scheduled regardless of the formula. The problem with that, however, is that how do you know that those drugs will not have medical uses? How do you guarantee that you simply don't overschedule um, drugs, and then you prevent very important medical use uh, that can later be discovered, such as uh, with uh, um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, where there is experimentation with LSD uh, that is actually showing that that might be some of the most helpful way to, for example, help traumatized uh, soldiers in the United States, traumatized veterans, traumatized foreign service officers. So there are real difficulties uh, with scheduling. Um, and how do you go about scheduling the synthetic drugs present uh, at, at, um, at levels with difficulties that are far greater than in um, plant-based uh, drugs? But you still need the cooperation of the government, right? No matter. Well, well, you need the cooperation of the government, but that's, that's another important issue, is that um, if only the labs were always illegal, we would have a limited problem. Uh, we uh, see the same phenomenon in, for example, wildlife trafficking, on which I work intensely on. The problem is that you often have a legal facility, in the case of wildlife trafficking, that's licensed to breed reptiles, for example, or in the case of drugs, that is licensed to produce drugs for good uses, for, for real patients. But yet some, within that facility, there is an illegal diversion or there is an illegal production of something that's scheduled. Mm. So the, it's not merely, if, if the problem were only of the lab uh, in the basement of Brookings where someone is illegally uh, cooking uh, <laughs> fentanyl, the problem would be very easy. Yeah, and there's also pride issues involved. I mean, there's, uh, drugs are in the category of things that nations feel easily humiliated and bruised about when pointed out by other nations that they have a role in it. And so it takes very careful, respectful diplomacy running longer than 140 characters. Hmm. <laughs> so we got people to change their behavior with c cigarettes by throwing the full weight of the public health system against that. Cigarette smoking is way down. We got people to change their behavior with HIV by by, uh, by public messaging and public health. Is that doable with drugs? We're talking about a brain chemistry issue here. Well, let's, yeah, and also let's be candid about what we did with tobacco. Um, we're not smoking in this room. Middle class people, upper class people, educated people, but uh, poor people still smoke at very high rates. And when you go into poor countries, uh, smoking is exploding. So, you know, it, we seem able to the more better off population, be able to persuade them, uh, you know, away to these things, educate, norms change, what's acceptable changes, and so on. But, you know, a lot of that ends up actually maximizing other forces pushing towards inequality. Uh, and so, you know, you, you see addiction much he more heavily among poor people. Seeing that with cannabis, I mean, 90% of legal cannabis sales, not 90, 85%, are, are to people who didn't graduate college. Mm. Um, so it's becoming, you know, you know, like that. So, and, and it may therefore require some broader interventions, economic interventions, uh, aren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, attached to drugs to 
give people alternatives, both to the economics of the drug trade, but also the rewards that may be appealing. If you think of a brain, think of it as a brain, it's all competition. Other rewarding things that would compete with the short-term rewards of drugs. Uh, Pagan, did you, did, did well, you see the Schuylers of the world being talked out of using drugs? Well, what I was going to say, what I heard from um, Chief Minard, so in Columbus they started a program called Heroin Overdose Prevention and Education. And so the, the police um, had a unit that would go out and do talks at schools, and then they would go with Skylers and they would drive them to treatment. They would reach out within 48 hours to anybody who'd overdosed in the area and interface with them and tell them what was out there and drive them to treatment. So um, it was a great program, and so we, we sort of profiled that in the, the fifth episode. But um, the chief was also telling me that they were starting to think maybe drug prevention and education needs to start around five. And that's something I heard before. And, and, he, and I have two five-year-olds, so I paid attention. And he said, you know, kids, when they're given medicine, it shouldn't taste like candy. It shouldn't look good. He said, you know, maybe there's a whole, and I guess there's a lot of uh, literature around this. They were just talking about how to really make prevention work. Because what I saw with the Skylers, what I was mentioning to them before, is we profiled a number of addicts. Um, it was pretty hard to do. It's, it's hard to, to be around heroin addicts. It's hard to be around somebody who's being so destructive to themselves. It, it was hard on my career. It was hard on all of us. But um, a lot of siblings and a number of siblings. Actually, the woman in the traffic stop overdosed and died a couple months after we filmed with her. Oh. Um, and a number, we filmed with a number of kids, and almost all of them had a sibling who was um, addicted as well. Um, we didn't see what you hear about a lot in the paper, where, but we heard about it. Um, you know, mothers using with daughters, using with sons, whole families using together. But the point of entry for many people is their family. Hmm. And that was something that I didn't quite realize because I was thinking it was still people at school. So how prevention and education is supposed to work, I really don't know. Because in the second episode, we follow a, a woman who, a young woman who had died, and she'd been a perfect student at school. Her brother was the problem kid, got married, nothing. And then some neighbors moved in, and they were shooting up. And one day she went over, and within six months she was on the street. She was hooking, you know, I mean, she was prostituting herself, and um, she ended up dying, and uh, it's a mysterious thing, this addiction. It's very, very powerful. It's very, very powerful. The, the, the amount of times people go to rehab and still, it's, I just don't know. I don't know how we're going to fight this. I mean, I'm not an expert, but from what I see, it's so powerful. We have about 15 minutes for questions from you all. I think there are mics somewhere. If I could ask your indulgence that you pose questions rather than uh, long preambles or speeches to us, we would really, you really want to hear from these three folks. So um, take it away. I thank you all for your comments. My name is Dave Ramaswamy. I have a consulting company. I work in agriculture. Uh, this my question is maybe to Professor Keith. Uh, and uh, I want to raise the issue of nutrition uh, and psychiatry and, you know, connecting to the drug crisis. You know, in the U.S., I feel the gateway drug to powerful drugs is processed food and sugary foods because sugary foods leach nutrients from the body, especially renal, magnesium, and calcium. And, you know, this causes anxiety, depression, and, you know, various other... Uh, you know, pathologies. And your colleague at Stanford, Professor Sapolsky, has talked about how stress and chronic stress and social isolation, uh, you know, sir, leads to sir, drug. What's your question? So my question is, where's, you know, the, to your point also, the public health aspect or launching a war or tobacco kind of public health message, where do you see the role of nutrition and nutritive, nutritive psychotherapy uh, to prevent a lot of these drug pathologies. Thank you. Do you want to answer question by question or take a bunch of questions? In that? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, and I think good nutrition, good health is going to have numerous benefits, so we should be for it, even if it had no impact on addiction at all. Uh, many people are. Uh, definitely we have a sat an environment that is saturated, no pun intended, with uh, salts, uh, sugars, uh, fatty foods, 
We love these evolutionarily uh, for very good reasons, but in excess they kill us. It's very similar to, to the addictive substances. So I think there could be a place for general health as, as, a, as one thing that would help people avoid addiction. I think the more general point you made about stress, about Robert's work, uh, is definitely true. You know, the uh, drugs are rewarding anyway. Uh, you know, like heroin is rewarding. It binds to a receptor. It gives us euphoria. But if you're in a constant state of unease, and anxiety, for whatever reason, you could imagine you get an extra bout of relief from that. So things that give people, you know, a sense of peace, uh, comfort, without that may make them less prone to And I would just add one comment. Where, where we are see, uh, starting to see new emerging epidemics, I mentioned tramadol in West Africa. We're seeing that in the Middle East. We're seeing that across Africa. It's a um, big silent crisis happening because you have enormously traumatized populations as a result of wars in places like Syria, in places like Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, in Nigeria, in Somalia, without any access to any um, psychotherapy, right. without often any access to uh, any kind of psychological support for people that have gone through, through excruciating brutality with rapes, um, massacres, losses of their family members really on unprecedented scale with famine situations where mothers have to decide which child to leave behind to start to death. So enormous trauma across you know, hundreds of thousands of people, yet close to no or very limited psycho, um, social support, and consequently, enormously ripe situations, often with poor borders, poor controls, deficient state, often corrupt, problematic state to start with, uh, enormous um, potential already happening with new addictions to, uh, in places amidst these settings. Right over here. Uh, the gentleman in the, well, you did one. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Oh, Steve Winter is an independent consultant. I, actually, uh, down at, uh, in Maryland at, um, at Crownsville uh, uh, State Hospital, uh, there are certain detainees uh, convict, uh, you know, held because of uh, being convicted of uh, drug uh, offenses. And as part of uh, the detention there at the hospital, they're required to participate in NAR and non uh, uh, meetings, which are actually open to the public. Uh, and also the family members are encouraged to come to those. Now, uh, since they're essentially required to do that, do, do you see that as a, as a positive uh, element, or uh, would you be in favor of such programs? I, I don't know that specific program, but just say generally a good way to use the leverage of the court uh, is for therapeutic means. Uh, you know, we see this, we do this, you know, there is a whole field of therapeutic jurisprudence, for example, people who are seriously mentally ill, people who are addicted and so on, and it can be done well, it can be done badly, it has been done badly. But you know, there's no reason that motivations all have to be pure and, and from the heart, and there are plenty of people I can tell you who would say that it was pressure uh, from a court or from their family or from their worker that made them decide to change when they initially just wanted to keep using. How about the gentleman right behind him? Hi. Um, coming, growing up in the Midwest, I'm from Indianapolis, and my family all comes from Iowa, so I'm no stranger to opioids addictions. I can name off five different people who have dealt with that issue. Um, and my, my grandmother's own death almost happened a year early, earlier because when she was on hospice, she was um, given these pills. And thank God my mom intervened. She's a, she's a physician and was able to keep, get her off of that. My question, and I don't want to be that 20 year old who always asks about medicinal marijuana, but is there any way that that kind of pain management might be more effective than, um, than, than opioids? I, I personally don't know. And I'm, I'm just curious if it, if it would. So there are 200 different med non opioid medications that can have at least some applications for pain relief. So we definitely need to break the assumption that many people have is, if it's pain, then I shall prescribe an opioid. There's also plenty of things that aren't uh, uh, pharmacological at all. I mean, pe people, sometimes the best thing for a really bad back is to do some walking, do some yoga, strengthen your abdominal muscles. Whether, uh, whether uh, the cannabinoid system specifically, which is evolutionarily one of the oldest systems in, in our body and goes throughout the periphery, um, you know, has been implicated in uh, pain relief. Um, and the, the, to me, what this is where why we do science, right? We should be taking anything we can get out of that plant and uh, studying it. And it's been very hard because the regulations are, I mean, 
If I want to research pot, I have to fill out a stack of paper like that. But if I want to smoke it, I can just walk across the street and buy it. That's, <laughs> that's kind of strange, but that's the situation. So we should study that. It, it, will, it will not be, though, uh, a, a huge blockbuster. There will be people who benefit enormously, but because we already have all these other medications that, you know, that, that work pretty well for pain, um, I, I'm not expecting it to you know, change the whole world, but there'll probably be some people who will be helped, and they should be helped. But, Keith, my insurance covers the opioid pills, mm-hmm. and I can't get coverage for the physical therapy, the acupuncture, the yoga. That is often a problem. And in, in the parallel one is that if you want to get on buprenorphine to treat your addiction, it's often harder for uh, the doctor to put you on it. And this is something the, the psychiatrists in uh, our department, you know, uh, rant about, and I don't blame them, that they, they, they have a patient who wants to enter treatment, they want to get them on buprenorphine, and they have to fight with the insurer, where literally they could hand them a bottle of OxyContin, and there would be no questions asked. So yeah, so we, we, you, you want to design health insurance to um, richly reimburse the things you want, and, and not the things that you don't. And we, we, we haven't, haven't done that um, so, yeah, that's a hugely important topic. Very quickly, Pagan, did you see um, Skylar's folks going broke trying to keep, his, keep him with medication? Yeah. I mean, they've, they, most of the parents we met had spent all their savings trying to help their kids. They're, both of her sons right now are in treatment, and I'm not sure if that's still covered on their insurance or how they're doing it. So they're just paying cash? Yeah, I think so. And, of course, there is the mental health dimension that Keith fought very hard when he was in the government Mm. that uh, became part of uh, Obamacare, where um, uh, many people who are uh, addicted are people with uh, uh, mental mental problems, mental difficulties, mental illness, and yet often their coverage is minimal to non-existent. How about uh, the gentleman over there? We have one mic, huh? Two? Oh, sorry. Um, So I know that there aren't many places that have been immune to this epidemic, but um, also that states haven't been hit equally. Um, And I'm curious, I know that uh, none of you have a a background in epidemiology, but I'm curious about whether, you know, when we look at states like Nebraska that haven't really had the same kind of issues as West Virginia or New Hampshire, whether you see any uh, regulations in particular uh, that have acted as protective factors. Good question. That is a good question. I mean, Part of it is luck. Um, you know, California, we have not had fentanyl so much because we are supplied with black tar heroin, which is harder to blend fentanyl in, and uh, we have not been hit as, as hard as the Midwest, which is supplied differently. So some of that is you know, entirely outside the realm of policy. Um, you, we, we do know from Christopher Room's work that exposure, just the volume of prescribing, you know, predicts having a problem no matter where you are. So, you know, West Virginia, you know, it was a very high overdose rate. It also had an incredibly high prescribing rate. So people getting exposed over and over again. And then, and then second, areas that are uh, poor and have poor health infrastructure are suffering more. It's not that people in the rural areas, you know, are more likely to use an opioid than someone who's living in a city but their access to treatment is way less. Their likelihood of having naloxone, having an ambulance that can even get to them in an hour is way less. So there's a lot of you know, added harm that comes to them uh, because of those reasons. Let's try to... Just a quick follow-up. This is curious to me because we see a state like Massachusetts that's actually been, you know, has the, the highest rate of opioid overdose in the country. Yeah. Is that a Yeah, if I made it sound simple, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to get one or two more in there. My name is Anam Niazi. I'm an internal medicine resident physician practicing in Macon, Georgia. Um, I care a lot about my patients, and I also have a passion for research. So my question is, uh, from the panel, what do you recommend in the medical community that we need to investigate for the current landscape of the opioid crisis? That's a good one. I'm trying to... I mean, there's, there's lots to be done. Um, basic epidemiology. We don't know how many people use heroin in this country. We, we really have, I mean, uh, um, we have no idea. Uh, you know, we, we, we call, we have the government call people up at home and ask, do you use heroin? And people say no, so I guess there's no problem. <laughs> so, but that's something we could find out through better clinical epidemiology. So because, you know, in the emergency room, 
for example, where people get, you know, uh, as you would know, you know, get screened um, in aggregating that data. Working with uh, coroners, the data we have is three years old. So we're perpetually saying, well, did this policy work? Well, I don't know. I won't get the data for like five years. So in a world where if, you know, if I, you know, uh, called Jeff Bezos up and I said, how many blue washing machines do you have? He could tell me right now where they are and which ones are broken and, um, and who has them and who's going to buy them instantly. Why can we not tell whether someone is dead uh, you know, w without an interval of three years? So that could be something you know, that you know, it, it could be a partnership but, you know, between those physicians who work in, in coroner's offices, working with CDC and maybe working with private companies so that it is instantly known when someone has died of an overdose, and exactly what drugs they died of. And we would have a dashboard, and, we, and every state would know this is working, that's not working, and instead of this ridiculous backward-looking thing. And then the last thing, I think the most important thing doctors can do is help other doctors become better prescribers. Because I, you know, I, I never wanted, when I, when I was in the government, I never wanted to you know, intervene with doctors. I mean, that was not why I, I came to help, but, but somebody has to. And the best way for that to happen is doctor-to-doctor -doctor conversation and change. Because doctors listen to other doctors, as you know, in the way they won't listen to people on the other side. So anything you can do about that, I think, is a, a great way to prevent people from getting into this situation in the first place. Last one. I feel honored. Thank you. Um, I wrote the long story here, but I'll try to be brief. I'm curious about physicians that if there's a way that physicians and uh, pharmacies are linking patient files, if there's a regulation, if we're planning that in the future, lost a dear friend to the epidemic who had the resources to go across the nation through work travel and find the drug she needed. Um, so can you tell me about that? So, Yeah. There's been a lot of expansion of what's called prescription drug monitoring. Uh, some of it is very good and sophisticated and up-to-date, and some of it is dreadful and slow and nearly useless and drives doctors insane when they try to access it. Um, but that is, that is something that could be helpful for this problem, but also more general problems of coordination of care. Uh, you know, uh, you don't know what other person is prescribing. I mean, a classic example would be, Somebody is seeing a psychiatrist for an anxiety disorder. They're taking a benzodiazepine, which is a, a tranquilizer. Then they, they really get hurt. Let's say they fall down a flight of stairs, and their primary care doctor is going to give them, you know, you know, four days of Vicodin, but doesn't know that that person's on a benzodiazepine, and those two drugs together greatly increase their risk of, of dying. Well, that's a, that's a big data problem that is eminently solvable if we, if we monitor all prescriptions and then also require doctors to check, as some states are now doing, before they write that controlled substance thing. They're supposed to look and see, wait a minute, what else is this person taking, and could this prescription actually harm them instead of help them? I have to cut it off now. I'm sorry. Um, we're at the end. Um, I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, we really want to thank our panelists who are just thank terrific. You, uh, if you'd like to hear this conversation on, on a podcast, um, you can search, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, Brookings Podcast on your podcast app. If you'd like to view The Trade, uh, you can go to show.com slash The Trade. And uh, these things are written down in your handouts. And the last thing is that we have another event. Uh, and so if you could all please pick up around your chairs, we would appreciate it. Thanks very much. <laughs>